chicka wow wow. <laughs> so yeah, we get to talk about sex today. Are you excited? Yeah. Oh, good. Some people are clapping. Yes. All right. I like that. Are you nervous? I'm nervous. No one's more nervous than my wife sitting right over there. I'm, uh, I'm famous for saying things that cause her to kind of glare at me or, or, you know, or slap her forehead and shake her head. She has no idea what I'm about to say. And to be honest, neither do I. Just kidding. I'm joking. I'm glad we're talking about this. We're in week six of, I'm sorry, week four of a six-week series called Six Lies That Americans Christians Believe. And our world says that Christianity's view on sex is prudish, it's old-fashioned, it's out of touch with today's progressive lifestyles. And the more that some Christians, and, and remember, that I, I don't want you to miss that word, it's, it's that box in the, in the orange, that American Christians. So we're not talking about a culture that doesn't know God, we're talking about us as believers. So the more that some Christians hear that, that, that sex, the, the, the biblical view is prudish, old-fashioned, out of touch, then the more that we start to believe it. You start to think that the stuff that we read in God's Word uh, is probably, it probably worked for those people that were in the Bible, but it, it's, really not, it, it, it's really not relevant today. I mean, we've, come on, God, we've evolved. Things have changed. Uh, fashions have changed. Views have changed. We're, we're enlightened. We know more now. We know a lot better now. This is 2017. A lot has changed. And God's original design doesn't work anymore. And in fact, it, it just doesn't apply to today's world. And that's the lie that we start to believe and the lie that we start to not only believe, but that's a lie that we start to share with others. If you have your Bible, turn into 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, 1 Thessalonians is one of Paul's letters to, to uh, the churches that, that he visited, and one of the churches was in Thessalonica that he actually started. Uh, it's a small book in the New Testament, so you might, you might skim over it really quick, but just be careful that you don't go past, and you can uh, look in your table of contents if you'd like to. Um, or if it's on your app or on your phone, you're, you're going to go right to it. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to look at verses 3, 4, and 5. And, and I'm going to read a little bit, but I'm going to be stopping. So uh, if, if you'd like to read the whole passage, this might frustrate you. We're going to get to the whole passage, but I'm going to read and stop and talk just a little bit. So here we go. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 5. And I'm reading in the, in the ESV. It says, for this is the will of God. Okay, we're going to stop right there. Okay, we need to get ready for what we're about to hear. The, those seven words should actually make you sit up in your, in your pew, in your chair. They, they should make you lean in a little bit, and, and you want to put all your focus on what's about to come next. Okay, that's, this is what we all want to know anyway as believers, right? We want to know what is God's will for our lives. What is it that he wants for us? So this, what he's about to say, this is going to be gold. This is, you want to grab onto this. You might even want to get ready to write this down or highlight it in your Bible. So for this is the will of God. Let's keep reading. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. So what is God's will for your life? He wants you to be sanctified. He wants you to be sanctified. And that's a, that's a church word that means, basically means becoming more like Christ. And, and according to Easton's Bible Dictionary, sanctification, this is a quote, involves more than a mere moral reformation of character brought about by the power of truth. So it's, it's more than just being a, a good person. But it goes on. It says, it is the work of the Holy Spirit bringing the whole nature more and more under the influence of the new gracious principles implanted in the soul in regeneration. In other words, sanctification is the carrying on to perfection, the work begun in re regeneration, and it extends to the whole man. So it's, it's the process of, of your, your whole self, your whole being, becoming more and more like God and surrendering over your, yourself to, to God and to what He wants for your life. That's God's will for your life, is He wants you to be sanctified. Now, you may have heard of another, another church word, and it's called justification, and I don't want you to get these two confused. This is going to be really simplified, but justification is, has more to do with about location, okay? So when, before you became a Christian, you were in the kingdom of darkness, you, you, you were bound for an eternity separated from God. But Jesus made a way through his death and his resurrection uh, for us to go from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Sins are forgiven, uh, a new life in Christ, and spending eternity with him in heaven. That's justification. Just 
as if I had never sinned. That's what Jesus' death, his blood, his resurrection, that's what it did for us, for those who believe. It gives, us, it gives us a new address. We're no longer in the kingdom of darkness, but we are in the kingdom of life. Now, sanctification starts once, we, once we've moved to the kingdom of life. And sanctification is that process of becoming more and more like Christ. You could call it discipleship, growing in your relationship with him, being the people that he's called us to be. That's his will. He wants to help us, okay? He wants to help us through the power of the Holy Spirit that is in every believer to see life through Christ instead of the, see life through Christ's eyes instead of the eyes of self. Now, there, there is this part of us that wants to go back to the old way of life. That's, that's our flesh, and, and, and we, don't ever, we don't ever lose that part of us, unfortunately, because if it was all about just becoming a follower of Jesus, becoming a Christian, then I think when we became a Christian, then God would immediately take us to heaven, but there's, there's more to it, because God wants, God wants to mold us and shape us, and, and He wants to use us while we're here on this earth, but there is that part of us that wants to go back to the old way of life, the old way of thinking. We want to choose what we want to do. But sanctification is the process where we stop asking what we want and we start asking, God, what do you want for our lives? What do you think about this situation? What does God want us to give our lives over to? What are God's priorities for us? So God's will... You should, you should write this down. God's will is for you to be sanctified. Okay, now look at what he says next. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. Now, Paul is writing this church, or writing this letter to the Thessalonians, okay? And this is a church that he helped start. And these are new, new followers to Christ, new believers that he's talking to. And look what he told them about sanctification. Now, we just told you what sanctification was. It was the process of becoming more and more like Christ. And, and what is it that, that Paul tells these new Christians? Did he tell them, you, you know, make sure that you read the scriptures and memorize those? No, he didn't say that. He, 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 did he say, you know, you need to be, make sure you pray and, and that you fast? No, he, he didn't really cover that part in this, in this section. Was it give your tithes and offerings? That'll be, make you more and more like Christ. No. He said abstain from sexual immorality. Paul knows that the culture that these new believers are living in ignores, okay, it ignores, so see if this sounds familiar, it ignores and oftentimes encourages sexual immorality. And he's telling them they need to resist the urge to go back to the old way of thinking. That was, that was the culture, that was the life that they came from, that was the kingdom of darkness, now they're in the kingdom of light, and he's saying in order for your... To, For your sanctification, you need to make sure that you don't go back into that old way of life. Sexual immorality will keep you from becoming what God wants you to be. Sexual immorality will hinder, it will hinder your growth in Christ. Sexual immorality is not, make sure you hear this, is not God's will for your life. But let's keep reading. It says that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. And look at that phrase, who do not know God. Paul is saying that we don't need to act like people who don't know God. Why? Because we do know God. We, we, are, we are followers. We are followers of God. Once you get married, you don't still live life as a single person, do you? No, you don't do that. Why don't you do that? Because you're married. You know, and if you live your life like a single, then your marriage won't last very long. But Paul's saying, listen, we're followers of God, so don't, don't act like, don't live like, don't think like people who don't know God. We need to make sure that we're following the truth and not just following culture or something that, that we've made up. Now, here's a, here's a question that gets a lot of us into trouble. And the, the quest, this question, this is a question that gets us to start believing in lies especially the lies that, that we've been talking about, the, this one today and the other five that we've addressed or that we're going to address. And, and the question is this. Ready for it? What do I want? What do I want? Now, a lot of you, uh, after, after this service, you're going to go off, to, go to your Bible fellowship groups and, and spend some time in community and prayer. But after that, what you're going to do is you're probably going to, most of you will probably go somewhere uh, you, uh, you'll go eat, you'll go have lunch, and you're going to ask that question, what do I want? 
What do I want? Do I want Mexican food, Italian food, Chinese food, buffet, fast food, sit down, restaurant? And you're going to act based on what you want. Whatever you feel like, whatever it is that, that you, you know, I'm, I'm hungry for this, that's where you're going to go. But here's the deal. A lot of times in our lives, with not just little decisions like that, but with big time life decisions and, and, and big time thinking that we go through, we ask the question, what do I want? And, and I want to tell you, that's an okay question to ask as long as it's not the only question you ask. When the only question you ask is, what do I want? Then you're completely ignoring what is best, that question. Or even better, you're completely ignoring the question, what does God want for me? We mess up when we try to live in the kingdom of self. Remember we said we went from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light? Well, there's a little, uh, there's a little subdivision to the kingdom of darkness, and it's called the kingdom of self. And a lot of us try to live there, and, and, and the kingdom of self means that I want to be in control. And if I'm in control, then I get to do what I think is best and, and what I think is right and, and what sounds good to me. And, and not only that, I'm, I'm going to figure out how to kind of how to justify what I think so, so that I can, I can get what I want and, and I can feel okay with the decisions that I make and the choices that, that I do. But verse 5 in, uh, in that Ephesians passage we just read, or the Thessalonians passage we just read, says that we're not living in the kingdom of self, but we need to live in the kingdom of God. It's easy to buy, it's, here's the deal, it's easy to buy into lies when we're living in the kingdom of self. In the kingdom of self, you're not worried about sanctification, you're not worried about becoming more and more like Christ. The only thing you're worried about is feeding your appetites, feeding the desires that you have. But Paul reminds us that we should not live as people who don't know God. We should be doing things differently, thinking through things differently, responding to things differently, responding to life and to life circumstances and temptations. So we, we, the lie is, is that God, God, my sex life is none of God's business. So that's the lie. But what's the truth? Well, here's the truth. And you got a lot of blanks, so, so get ready. Here's the truth. God is Lord of all. God is Lord of all, including your sex life. First Chronicles 29, 11 through 12 says this. This is a great verse. It says, Lord, you are great and powerful. You have glory, victory, and honor. Everything in heaven and on earth belongs to you. The kingdom belongs to you, Lord. You are the ruler over everything. Riches and honor come from you. You rule everything. You have the power and strength to make anyone great and strong. That verse is pretty clear about who's boss. That verse is very clear about who's in charge. That verse is really clear about who's Lord over all, and it's God. Every part of us, every part of us, every part of our life, including our sex life, it all belongs to God. That's the truth. Now, whether we believe it or, or whether we act on it, that's a different story. It doesn't, but that doesn't change the truth that God is Lord of all. He created you. He created sex, and with that comes a specific design and a purpose for sex. And don't you think we should discover what God's design and purpose for sex is? Okay, that's where everybody should go, yes. Yes, we should discover that. Yes, that's a good thing to discover. We should do that. So I hope you have your, your pen or your pencil or, or you know, your, whatever your device you're going to take notes on because there's a lot of writing, and here we go. Here's the first one. Number one, God's design for sex is for it to be between one man and one woman in a covenant marriage as an expression of intimacy and love for procreation and as an illustration of the unity between Christ and his church. Let me give you just a few seconds to write all that down. Okay, did you get all that? Now, I'm, I'm 100% positive that's exactly what your parents told you when they had the sex talk with you. That's the definition they pulled out, right? That's, that's exactly word for word what they shared. I'm, I, but, of course, I'm assuming they had the sex talk with you. Actually, I'm amazed. I'm amazed. I won't ask you to raise your hands. But I'm amazed at how many parents did not or do not talk to their parents about, or talk to their children about sex, or your parents. That's kind of weird, too. You know, I, I, I'm amazed at, at, at how, how much that doesn't happen. And, and, and I get it. It's, it's, it's a difficult subject to, to discuss. It's, it's very awkward 
And matter of fact, you should talk to, to my three kids and, 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 and talk to them about the awkward conversations they have. And they were mostly awkward because I have the mind of a middle school boy. There was really, well, uh, there was really only one adult in the room when we were having these conversations, and it was Shonda. But why would you not talk to your kids about something that is so powerful and can be so destructive and can have some amazing, amazingly painful and hurtful circumstances and consequences? So instead of talking to your kids, what we're going to do is we'll let them talk to other kids their age and let them learn that way. Uh, or, or just let them learn from, from TV or, or online because uh, that, that sounds like a, a, a really great idea. That's primo. Anyway, back to what I was talking about. God's design for sex is for it to be between one man and one woman in a covenant marriage as an expression of that intimacy and love. In a covenant marriage, that, that, that's, a, that's put there for a reason, okay? I, I want you to notice that. I want you to circle that. Because a covenant marriage, is, it's not a typical marriage. A covenant marriage is saying to God that we want to love each other the way that you, God, want us to love one another. That's what we're committing our lives to. That's what we're committing our relationship to. That's when we stand before, stand before the preacher, you know, in the church or at the wedding venue or the court, whatever we're doing. That's, that's what we're saying to each other is, God, we want to love each other the way that you want us to love one another. It's not a marriage of convenience. It's not a marriage that it's just as long as things are going okay, or it's not a marriage of, as well, as long as you make me happy and we don't have any problems. But the moment this gets hard, I mean, we're just... Just, you know, peace out, we'll, we'll shake hands and go our own separate ways. No, this is different. It's a marriage that is characterized by unconditional love, sacrifice, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Do those sound familiar? That's a covenant marriage. Hebrews 13, 4 says, Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. You and I read this and we think, okay, ah. Uh, all right? But this type of thinking, this was radical in the writer of Hebrews world. Being, being a one-woman guy was considered kind of unreasonable and almost impossible in the culture of that day. And what's funny is, in today's world, that's probably not too far off from the truth. Sex is something that is, is supposed to be for a husband and a wife to share together. It's, it's supposed to be honored. And the word honor there means precious, or, or valuable. It, it's used, that word there is used several times in Scripture. Matter of fact, the Apostle Peter uses the same word when he describes God's, Jesus' precious blood in 1 Peter 1.19. And then he says, God's precious and magnificent promises. So, so when, when the Bible says that, that the sexual bed should be honored, it, it is precious. And it's the same word. And he used that precious and magnificent promises in 2 Peter. So this is something that's not to be taken lightly. This is not something that's just, just to be messed around with. This is something that is valuable. This is something that has meaning. This was designed for a husband and a wife to share with one another as an expression of their deep connection and their love for each other. Genesis 2, 23 through 25 says, The man said, this, this is Adam talking, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall, be called, they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they weren't ashamed. Now, this passage, I, I, I love this passage, and I can just imagine... Adam, you know, when Eve is, he wakes up and Eve is there and he's like, I really like this. This, this is, this is good. This is bone of my bone. This is flesh of my flesh. This God, this is different than anything else that you've showed me so far. And, and Adam's relationship, it was, it was going to be different with this creature than, than all of the other things that God created. He would experience something with her that would be sweet that would be intimate, that would be amazing, that would be joyful, and that would be awesome. It would be awesome. And notice, they were naked and not ashamed. Why? Well, they were naked and not ashamed because there was no reason to be ashamed. Absolutely none. They were doing what they were created to do. Their relationship, their marriage was established by God. This relationship was sacred. It was created. It was formed by God. Ephesians 5, 31 through 32 says, As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it's an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. 
That last section of that verse says, it's a great mystery, but it's an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. You see, marriage, a covenant marriage, the way that what God designed, it's a picture of the bond between Christ and the church. It's, it's an expression, it's an earthly expression of, of the bond between Christ and the church. And, and sex is an expression of of that bond, the intimacy that man and woman, the man and woman have, and in the intimacy that, that God and His church have. One commentary writes that the marriage tie takes precedence over every other human relationship, and for this reason is to be regarded as inviolable. Now, I actually had to look that word up, and it simply means cannot be violated. So uh, there you go, you learned a new word, or at least I did. It can't be violated. It, 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 in other words, it, it, you, can't, you, you can't take it out of its context. This, this relationship, it, it, it's, so, it's so precious, it's so unique, it, it's a covenant, and it's meant for one man, for one woman, and nothing should violate that, nothing. Most marriages in biblical times were, were seen more as contracts, and, and they, were, they were somewhat far less sacred. But here, God's standard for marriage is more than just a contract. Uh, In fact, earlier in in chapter 5 of Ephesians, he lays out specifically how the couple should submit to one another and how husbands and wives should love one another. You see, marriage is an earthly picture of God's relationship with his people, a relationship marked with sacrifice, unconditional love, unity, intimacy, grace, mercy, forgiveness, and the giving of self completely. Sex is the expression of giving oneself totally, totally, to another. God gave himself to us, and we are to completely surrender to him. Next thing there on your outline. Um, So when an individual's feelings, okay, you might want to circle that word feeling. When an individual's feelings become authoritative, then God's word is rendered insignificant. Did you catch that? So when our feelings start to be the authority in our life, then God's word, it's, it's pretty much rendered impotent. It's, it's insignificant. Truth gets trampled once you start living a life based on what makes me happy. When you cross the line from this is, well, this is what I feel to this is my right. Notice the difference? Well, this, this is, this is kind of what I feel. Now you're going, this is my right. Then your moral compass is no longer based on an absolute truth. Instead, you've, you've kind of raised your sail and, and you'll be guided however the, the culture, the, the wind blows of culture. But most people would argue that there is no absolute truth. And it's naive to think that there is one way for all people to think and believe. That's why scripture is seen as out of touch or, or it's seen irrelevant. It speaks of truth and absolute truth created by God in order that his creation can live in a way that will be beneficial to them and bring glory and honor to him. That's what scripture speaks of. But who wants to live for God when you can live for yourself? That's what, that's that's the lie that that people are telling us. When your feelings are the the ultimate authority, then you convince yourself of stuff like this. Well, well, we we really love each other, so it's okay. Or, you know, we're going to get married anyway. Or I I wouldn't buy a car without test driving it, so so why would I get married without us first living together? You know, it's just sex. It's it's, it's purely physical. It doesn't mean anything. I'm not hurting anyone by looking at porn. I mean, this is just just me all by myself. We're we're, we're not actually having physical sex. I mean, we're, you know, we're we're having conversations, but, but he gets me or, or she really understands me and, and I, I, run, I really want him to like me so, so I, I, I'm not, I can't say no or, or if, if, if they really love me they, they would do this for me and on and on and on and on. You see when, when you live that lie that it's about what you feel and that becomes the authority then you talk yourself into stuff and God's word is just a book. Third thing, if an individual's feelings are in opposition to God's word, I want you to know something. It isn't because God's word is wrong. If an individual's feelings are in opposition to God, it's not because God's word is wrong. Turn to the people sitting next to you, and I want you to tell them, you're not God. Go ahead and do that. Okay? Make sure you tell them back. They're not God either. You know, and I, I think that's something 
that's something that we need to remind ourselves of. We're not God. We're not in charge. We're, we're not in control. He is. He is the great I am. He's the creator of the universe. He, he's the one that set the world into motion. He's the one that spoke things into existence. I don't know if you've ever done that. I doubt that you've ever done that. I've never done that where I just said something and something was made. God did that. He is. And it's crazy for us as Christ followers. Remember, if, if you're not a Christian, I'm not really, I mean, I hope you're listening and paying attention, but I'm really talking to the followers of Christ. Because if we as Christ followers stand before God, it's crazy for us to stand before God and say, you're wrong on this one. You're wrong on this one. Okay, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Romans 3.10 says, as it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. So I just wanted to share those verses with you before you got a really big head and thought you were God and thought that, that you alone are good and, and that anything good comes from you and, and you have all the wisdom. It's not. Our hearts are deceitful. We're not righteous on, ourselves, on our own. Nobody is. Any good that comes from us comes from God. Any wisdom that we have is wisdom that comes from God. Matter of fact, in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, we're reminded by Paul. It says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. He's saying that God's word is there to equip us, teach us, correct us in our sanctification process. To get us from, from the kingdom of darkness. It, it's there to tell us how to get from the kingdom of darkness and what that means. To get to the kingdom of, of life, to light, and then how we should live once we belong to the kingdom of life. So why would we ignore the very thing that God gave us? The instructions on how to live a life that he's told us to live. You know why you ignore it? Same reason that you toss aside the instructions when you're putting something together. You toss it aside because you say, I've got this. I know how to put this together. I know how this works. Easy peasy. No big deal. But here's the truth. You don't got it. You don't. And we need God. And we need God's truth. We need God's word. Number four, if we do not see God as Lord of all, this is similar to the second point. If we do not see God as Lord of all, then we will create a framework of belief that we feel best suits our wants, needs, and our desires. So if God's not Lord of all, then I'm going to go off of what I feel and what I think. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to create this new framework of belief, the, the, a new framework of the way that I'm going to think, and that's going to transition to my heart. And then from my heart, it's going to go out into how I live. When you have no true north... When you have no absolute truth, and guess what? You create one. I expect a person who does not love God, who does not submit to God, who doesn't acknowledge God, I expect that person to create his or her own, her, his or her own rules about life, his or her own truth. But as a Christ follower, that flies directly into the face of what a Christ follower is. If you're creating your own truth, then, then you're really not following Christ. You're making up your own path, and there is no such thing um, with God when it, com when it comes to surrendering our lives, giving our lives over to him. There is no such thing as conditional surrender. There's no negotiating with God. God, you know, let's, God, can we do this 50-50? Okay, or, or, or maybe, okay, look, 70-30, God. Okay, okay, God, I get it. 95-5. Just let me hang on to this 5% and, and we'll be good. I'll give, you, I'll give you 95. You don't do that with God. God calls for our all, and then he will equip us to follow through with that commitment. So who's, who's the architect that's working on your life? Who's, who's producing the blueprints? God doesn't want part of that house. He wants, he demands, and here's the big one. He deserves. He deserves it all. We're not our own, Scripture tells us. Number five, God's boundaries for sex were not created as a form of punishment, but as a means of protection. A lot of people look at God and, and see him as the ultimate buzzkill. He's, he's the ultimate party pooper. You know, he's wah, wah, that's God. When God comes on the scene, God, he, he, he exists only to destroy my fun and my enjoyment. He's the one, he's the one that, that always makes you put on your jacket before you go outside. He's the one that makes you wear your helmet when you're riding your scooter around. You're like, come on, God, come on. None of the other gods make their followers do that. Why, why do I have to? 
But that's, that's not God. God created sex. So he knows it. He knows sex. And he knows how amazing it can be. But he also knows the damage that it can cause. He wants you to have it. But he wants you to have it in the context and, and for the design in which he made it. It's not like God is going, ha ha, look what I've got. And you can't have it. No. He's saying, I want this for you. I created this for you. But I created it for a specific purpose and with a specific context. Some of you have, in your homes, you have fireplaces, right? And when you light the fire in your fireplace, I'm pretty sure that none of you are secretly upset that you have to light the fire in the fireplace. You're not saying, oh man, this is no fun. Why can't we light the fire on our bed? Or, hey, let's, let's, let's put the fire in the kids' room. You don't do that because you know that a fire in the fireplace is warm and cozy, but a fire outside of the fireplace is destruction. It's 911. God's boundaries are there to protect us because he knows, he knows the consequences, which leads us to number six. Taking sex out of the context of marriage is sin and has devastating consequences. Colossians 6 I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 6, 15 through 20 says, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. You should underline that. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexual immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. You see, sex is more than just physical. It's more than just a physical act. Don't believe me? Then talk to people who've been victims of any type of sexual abuse. Talk to people who, who, who have, who've had to do things against their will. Talk to, talk to girls who, uh, and ladies who feel shame and guilt for having sex with their boyfriends. Or, or talk to guys maybe who who feel the same way or, or who feel shame and, and guilt after maybe that they've, they've watched pornography. Um, and they feel guilt, they feel shame, they feel empty because deep down they know it's wrong. What they, they, they basically just objectified a person. If sex was just physical, then people would heal and they would move on. But sex is deeper than just a physical act. The verse talks about joining the body with a prostitute. And the word joining is a word that speaks to a deep connection. And just to kind of give you a visual here, you ever, you ever kind of had to mess with packing tape, okay? And, and you know, when packing tape, it's, it's great, but once it, once it sticks together, right, it's done. It's frustrating. You can't, or, or, or you know, you have the packing, rape to, the, the, the packing tape roll, and you always kind of leave it, the flap up a little bit, because if it closes back over, it's, 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 it's over, why? Because that, that thing, is, is the adhesive is so strong that it, it's, it's just attached. And if you try to pull it, pull it apart, if you try to get that, then you end up just kind of destroying it. And you get angry and it's frustrated and it's just, it's over. And, and that's, that's a, I, I just kind of want to give you that picture because that's the picture that, that the Scripture is talking about when it talks about how you're joining your body with someone outside of what God wants for you. That's, that's the picture of, of, of us joining with, with God. Okay, that's, that's the closeness. That's the connection that we have from God. And sexual immorality, what that does is, is that rips apart, okay, the connection, the intimacy that we have with God. And so the, he's telling us there that that's, that's what we're doing. And so to try to have to have sex or any kind of sexual relationship outside of God's design and God's context for marriage, it, it has consequences. It distorts and perverts what God intended to be beautiful, intimate, private, honorable, and loving. It's so devastating. Here's this. Listen to this. 
It's so devastating that Paul says that we should flee from it. You know what the word flee means? It means run. It means get out of there. It means don't hang around. It, it means go in the opposite direction. Sexual immorality is sin, and it is in direct opposition to God's will for our lives. It's in direct opposition of the connection that he created us to have with him and that he created us to have with our spouse. Because remember, husband and wife, picture of God's relationship with the church. Which leads to number seven. Sexual sin, I don't want to forget, leave this out. Sexual sin is covered by God's grace and he promises forgiveness and restoration. Some of you may be in this right now. You're right in the middle of, of sexual immorality. And you didn't want to come, but come here, but God, God brought you here or somebody dragged you here for whatever reason and you're hearing this and you just feel, boom, beat on, beat on, beat on. Great, I'm a sinner. Great, I'm horrible. Great, blah, 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 blah. No, no. Yes, we want you to know what you're involved in is sin. We're all sinners. But God, God's grace covers that sin and he promises forgiveness and he promises restoration. And what I want you to, I want you to write these three words right outside that, that note there. It says, okay, so sexual sin is covered by God's grace and he promises forgiveness and restoration. Right outside, if we repent. So that's, a, that's an important piece. God's, no, God's under no obligation to forgive an unrepentant heart. That means if you're coming to God and you're saying, God, my, my bad for last night or, or my bad for, for just a few minutes ago. <laughs> you know, just, hey, please forgive me and, and I'll get back to my life. That's, that's not repentance. Repentance means turning from. It's saying, I don't want to be in charge of my life anymore, God, because me in charge is not working. I want you to be Lord. Sexual immorality, it, it's, it's not the unforgivable sin. It can have devastating consequences, yes, but it is something that God can and will forgive, and this is the important piece, and he will also give restoration. He will make you whole. He will make you complete again. That's a huge piece. Restoration. You're made new. Some people feel like that it is impossible. Like because it's like, Jimmy, you don't know my circumstance. You don't know my situation. You don't know, you don't know what I've done. You don't know how far down this road I've been. But we have to remember, with God, all things are possible. Acts 3.19 says, and, and I love reading it in this. Uh, if you can go ahead and throw it up there on the screen. It's the amplified version, and, and so it puts some things in there. It says, so repent. Change your inner self, your old way of thinking. Regret past sins and return to God. Seek his purpose for your life. Go on. So that your sins may be wiped away, blotted out, completely erased. So that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, restoring you like a cool wind on a hot day. That's that's what God wants to do. That's how he wants to restore all of us. Whether it's sexual immorality or it's any other sin, God wants to bring, us, bring that to us. But we have to come to him and repent. 1 John 1, 9 says, But God is faithful and fair. If we confess our sins, he will forgive our sins. He will forgive every wrong that we have done. He will make us pure. Man, that's good news for all of us. You know why? Because we're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. And I want to say just a, just a quick side note here. To those of you who have experienced sexual abuse, and I just want you to know this, that God loves you. And that has never changed. And though you don't maybe see yourself as valuable, though maybe you don't see yourself as worthy, maybe you, you don't see yourself, I want you to know that God desperately wants a relationship with you. God desperately wants to restore you. God wants to help you to, to move on from that. He doesn't want that to, to, be, to define you, but what he'd like to do is, is he'd like to move, move, for, move you forward. And yes, that'll be a part of your history. And yes, there are things that you'll have to deal with. And that, that was not your fault. That was not your doing. But what God wants to do is he wants to take you from there and he wants to move you forward. And he wants you to know that you are his creation, that you, you are what the Bible calls his masterpiece. And I'm sorry that someone took that from you, took that idea from you, but it's still, the truth is, is that you belong to him. And if that's you, 
and you need someone to talk to, I would encourage you to come talk to me or come talk to um, or someone on our staff. And we can help you and we can point you to people that can help you to get on the road to renewing, get on the, get on the road to becoming uh, the person that, that God wants you to be and to restore you and to make you whole again. Here's, here's, the, here's the bottom line. Last thing in your notes and I'm done. Do I trust God? It's the bottom line. Do you trust that God's purpose and design for sex is right? Do you trust that his design and purpose for sex is relevant? Do you trust that his design and purpose for sex is true? Do you trust that his design and purpose for sex is what's best? If you don't, then guess what? You'll continue to redefine truth, and you'll continue to create your own truth that fits you. But I can promise you this. It won't be best. It won't be right. And it is not God's will for you. It is not God's will for you. And this question of do I trust God is not just a a sexual question about sex and sexuality. This question is about everything that he's written in here and everything that he's called you to do. Do you trust him? Because if you do, then what you'll do is you'll surrender to him and you'll live as a person who's in the kingdom of light, and you will be working on your sanctification. That's where God wants us to be more and more like him. The truth is, I'm sorry, the lie is that my sex life is none of God's business. The truth is God is Lord of all.